Cultural graffiti. Graffiti is a claimed voice. It's a voice which is taken by someone who has no other way of expressing themselves. It's often held in opposition to a system. If you walk out into your local town, you'll be able to find the graffiti, probably not in the centre, probably not where everybody's watching, but around the sides, in the edgelands, perhaps on the back doors of shops, in alleyways, in subways, under bridges, on the sides of trains. Graffiti tends to exist in these spaces, a claimed subversive voice held in opposition to the system. But within our own organisations, where is the cultural graffiti? Where is the graffiti sprayed? It's easy to hear those known voices that we want to hear, but people have individual views that maybe they can't share in the wider organisation. They tend not, at least not often, to write them on the walls of the organisation. Instead, the cultural graffiti is expressed in stories, subversive stories, stories that are shared in small groups that establish commonality. It's held in claimed voices, anonymous voices, outside the system, claimed spaces where we can share the authentic story we want to share, rather than the story that we are given permission to share. But the funny thing is that graffiti is not always bad. Some types of graffiti, like tagging, are about claiming space, individual space and collective space. It's territorial. Territoriality is important. We need to feel our own space around us. Individuals in organisations also need their own space. We exist in strongly trust-bonded, tribal, local units. There's a fiction to believe that global organisations have an all-inclusive global culture. What they tend to have is a whole collection, a myriad of highly trust-bonded subcultures. People in different functions, in different offices, in different locations, people on projects, people who come together simply in opposition to a new policy or direction, people who come together to drive forward a new policy. We tend to collectivise and create our own space, either a physical space or quite often an online virtual hidden space, a new type of community. Well, social leaders have to understand community and need to understand where the cultural graffiti is sprayed, not so that they can go and paint over it, but so they can learn from it. Tagging's not the only type of graffiti. There's also mural art, often incredible, clever, beautiful paintings which represent a story in an image. There's posters which are pasted around the place. There's all sorts of different types of art, and there's all sorts of different types of cultural graffiti. Sure, in some places, people just want to stand in opposition. They may have nothing constructive to say and no interest in being involved in the constructive conversation. But in many cases, we have to remember that cultural graffiti is a claimed voice precisely because we have no voice within the formal system. Creating a space, creating a blank wall where people can paint their graffiti, where they can share the story they want to share, not just the story they feel they're allowed to share, that can have value because it can allow us to hear the things we wouldn't normally hear. That turns it round to the role of social leaders and formal leaders to think about how will they respond to those shared voices. Will they accuse people of being vandals? Will they seek them out, hunt them down and persecute them? Or will they have the humility to listen to some of those voices? Perhaps to work with those communities to understand how they can better tell their story, how they can have their voice heard. The funny thing about graffiti is you can never get rid of it. No matter how many rules you put in place, no matter how many sanctions are applied, you always get graffiti. When I travel around the world, I see it in every culture, in every country, even those ones where the penalties for spraying graffiti are really harsh. You may have to work hard to seek it out, but you can always find it. The reason you can always find it is because the power of graffiti is substantially empowered by the persecution of the organisation around it. The more we persecute it, the higher the value. If you're a graffiti artist and you're tagging at the start of your journey into graffiti, people often start as taggers. They don't just tag in safe spaces. They tag up high 
in derelict buildings on bridges. They tag on the sides of trains. If you paint on the side of a train, that invokes serious formal sanction. The transport police hate it when people paint on the side of trains. But it brings you high status and kudos within the graffiti community. Sometimes people create great artwork that they know will be obliterated in one or two hours. But they do so because telling the story is what counts, not the length that the story exists for. When we think about cultural graffiti, think about these things. Where are the spaces within our organisation where that cultural graffiti is sprayed? And how is it put there? Is it in images or is it in stories? Is it in words? Is it ever committed down onto paper or into a digital format? As social leaders, how can we create or hold open a space to find it and to recognise it and to learn from it? It's an organisation we should recognise. We're part of an ecosystem. Every true culture, every city doesn't just exist of the beautiful landmarks in the centre. We all need our industrial spaces, our residential spaces, our transport spaces. A healthy ecosystem has all of those. But do we really just want this kind of wisdom to be hidden away around the edges? Or are we willing to create a space where it can be heard in the centre?